Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, if you would please. Turn in your Bibles there. I'm turning in my Bible there. Good to be here. I mentioned uh, during the prayer earlier uh, about the pastors in Kenya. They are not allowed to have church. They are not allowed to have church out there. I'm really upset about that. Um, I don't know when they're going to be able to get to do it. Um, Pastor Cooley's church still meeting in a barn up in Minnesota because they have nosy neighbors who will tell on them if they walk into their church. They have a storefront church in the in the town there of Northfield, and um, Northfield's a factory. Do they have a? Um, I think it's a cream of wheat factory there or something like that. Yeah. And so it's a college town. They got a little factory there. So there's people there. And um, they've got nosy neighbors who tell on them. Who, the first time they decided to break the governor's order and have church, they got told on. People called the police department. Like it was, I'm sorry, but I don't like social distance cops. Which are not, I'm not talking about policemen. I'm talking about people who take it upon themselves Lindsay and I walked into uh, a gas station yesterday to get something. We took a little road trip yesterday. Lindsay and I walked in, and we were standing there next to each other. And, they, and this was a little country gas station. And the Nazi behind the counter said, uh, you two are standing too close together. And she said, this is my dad. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I guess that's okay then. Then I found out today, and I posted this on Facebook, I posted it on Twitter, New York City has released drones that are flying around, looking at people on the sidewalk, barking orders at them if they're too close to one another. Shoot those things! I'm a little upset about that. Huh? Ah, uh, yeah, whatever. At some point, a lot of people are fixing to get into a... Yes, ma'am. Uh, can they actually close the churches? Nope. Now, you heard it right. The governor said he's not going to let them open the churches. No, and they, he needs another job next year. He needs another... All, all of these, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, California, Nevada, New Jersey, New York... They all need new jobs, okay? Maybe uh, we could give them something that involves having to put rubber gloves on or something. Uh, I'm tired of this stuff. Uh, they cannot, Congress shall pass no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It is a constitutional right that we are guaranteed that we can have church. They have not shown reasonable um, cause why they're not allowing people, people, the same people who are prohibited from going to church, go stand in line at Walmart. Go stand in line at the liquor store, at the marijuana dispensaries, at the abortion clinics, you name it. They're standing in line and standing around one another yeah, don't get me started. Yeah, and what is your store? What is your store? Tell them. It's a it's a phone store, right? A phone store. I won't say what. I wasn't going to say what company, but yeah. And why they won't let them come to church? Church is essential. Church is, you're not guaranteed in the Constitution to be able to own a phone. You are guaranteed in the Constitution to be able to go to church. Okay? So, you know, I don't know. Anyway, Galatians 5. Better move on. Galatians 5. Uh, and, well, this kind of fits. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
is where this is going. Galatians 5 verse 7, you did run well. In other words, Paul said, I, I established this church or these churches. There were several of them, we believe. And you started out well. People were saved by Paul's preaching. And I guarantee you, Paul didn't preach that they had to be circumcised. Paul didn't preach that they had to keep the law. Paul didn't preach that they had to do some sort of thing in order to be saved. Paul preached the gospel. They responded to it. Paul taught them and established that church. And he stayed in those places long enough to be able to raise up and establish and ordain bishops over those churches, laid hands on them, and when everything was good, he left and moved on and did something somewhere else where he could do the same thing. That was his ministry. So as he left, and remember, Paul said this at the end, toward the end of the book of Acts. He said, after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in. And that is exactly what happened here. Grievous wolves entered in, not sparing the flock, and they go in and they're twisting the gospel around to make it a gospel of works. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Paul says, I want to know who did this. Was it somebody that came in after I left or somebody that was there while I was there that said that amen while I was preaching but really, after I left, they turned on those people. A lot of times that's how it happens. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And then he said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Um, where did they, just for general knowledge, where did they use leaven? What, what do they put leaven in? There's several things. Bread. Wine, beer, uh, any kind of alcohol. They take the sweetness of grain or the sweetness of grapes, the sweetness of rice, uh, the sweetness of corn. They take that. Leaven, yeast takes that, consumes the sugars out of whatever it is, takes the sweetness out, and then spurts out alcohol as a waste product. Because that's what it converts it into. It is... Yeast doo doo. That's what it is. Or yeast burp. And that then gets into whatever it is that you've got sitting there. Um, we also put yeast in our septic tanks because it eats the stuff in there. Okay? A little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. We're going to talk about that. I have confidence in you through the Lord. That you'll be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. That statement there. Let me, let me deal with this before I move on to the leaven part. I have a problem. And I don't mind standing up here with people watching, sharing uh, my problems. Um, one of my problems is I get pretty doggone judgmental. And I am someone, when I see, when I know what the Bible says, and I'm pretty clear on it. Now, there's some things I question, some things I'm not sure about. People have said things to me, and I'm going, you know, I'm going to have to think about that. But when I'm pretty certain about things, and somebody comes to me, which has happened several times, and they try to dissuade me with other ideas, um, I can get pretty worked up over it. We had a guy come several years ago, and uh, Michael remembers this because I had him kind of stay down with me. This is before we put locks on the doors, and there's a reason why we put locks on the doors. Uh, we had a guy come in, his car was loaded down with his stuff, and he just walks in the building. Now, I've got my daughters and my grandchildren here. So that, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, picky about who I let in the door anymore. Especially after we had a guy that beat up a cop down here on 55 and ran in this building five minutes before Sunday night service. Yeah, he beat up a cop. He had a pocket full of heroin. And um, two of our guys got him out of the building and gave him a, a ride over here in town 
to what we now realize was a drug house on Main Street. And the cops pulled in five minutes after they left and said, have you seen so-and-so? Uh, yeah, our guys just left with him. So they, they eventually caught the guy. So we've learned to be pretty secure around here. But this guy pulled in and he comes in, he's asking for me. So I go downstairs and he's a rough looking guy. And I don't know him from Adam. And he said that God had shown him some things. He wanted to share it with me. And I said, okay. And I cleared the room. I told everybody, you guys go upstairs. And Michael stayed down just to kind of watch what happened. And I sat and listened to this guy, and he wanted to take the long road around what he was going to say. And I said to him, why don't you just tell me what it is you believe, and then we'll go from there. And he said, nope, I've got to explain it this way. And I kept trying several times to say to him, look, if it's something that's real and true, I'll recognize it. Tell me what it is you think. He said, nope. He said, in fact, if I could bring all my computer equipment in and plug it into your network, and I said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and I could see he started getting agitated. And he said something, and I have no idea, I don't remember what it is he said, but he said something that I knew contradicted Scripture. And I said, hold on a second. And I quoted the Scripture. And he said, yeah, but you've got to hear me out the rest of it. I said, actually, No. Because if what you're saying is based on what you just told me, I already know that it's wrong. It breaks scripture. Scripture cannot be broken. If the foundation is faulty, what you're telling me won't stand. But he commenced to keep piling it on. And everything that he said, I knew was wrong. And I finally said, I could see him getting agitated. And I finally, I was getting a little scared. And I finally said, sir, I don't, I don't want to hurt your feelings for a million dollars. But I'm telling you right now that what you're telling me is totally dead wrong. And I commenced to give him scriptures. Well, he finally got mad, pounded his fist, grabbed his stuff, walked out the door. Now, people have said things to me that Maybe I didn't handle it so well. I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I doubt myself all the time, whether I handle myself the right way, the wrong way, a combination of both, I don't know. One thing to remember is that God judges everybody. He judges me. He judges you. And the people... Sometimes that we think that we have to correct all the time. You don't have to do that, you know. You don't have to do that. I will say that I know some people who never let a false statement go unchallenged. They think that it's their job to correct everybody on every issue and everything they do, say, think, whatever. Sometimes it's on social media. Sometimes it's to their face. And if you're somebody like that, expect to have a very, very short friends list. And I mean a real friend, not Facebook friend, a real friend. Because if all you do is correct everybody that you're around, nobody wants to be around you. Nobody wants that kind of relationship to constantly be chewed out for every little thing you do. Sometimes we make up rules of how we think everybody ought to act. And if somebody breaks our rules, whether or not in the Bible or not, if somebody breaks our rules, we let them know about it very quickly. Okay? And understand, and I'm talking to me first. He that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now, think about what he just said. He's not just saying at the end of life they're going to be judged. He said they're going to bear their judgment. You know what that means? That God has already judged them, and they have to carry that around the rest of their life. Just like we, things that we said or did, 
50 years ago. We still, we still carry it around, don't we? In my youth, on a school bus, when I was probably ninth grade, we ended up, we normally had a regular bus driver, and I get on the bus one time, and there's a fill-in, and he's a black guy. And out of stupidity, I yelled the N-word on that bus. Stupidity. And I regret that to this day, I regret that. Why did I even say that? Why did I do that? Stupid kid I was. And if I ever, I know that, I would know that guy face to face if I saw him today and I only saw him one time. But if I saw him today, I would go to him and say, you may not remember this but I offended you deeply, and I've hated myself every day since then. Okay, some things we bear all of our lives, and we're gonna have to bear it all of our lives. God has never let me see that man ever again, which means I have to go through life unforgiven of that offense, and that's not the only one. You know, you see what I'm saying now? We bear our judgment, don't we? We have to carry it the rest of our lives. So maybe, maybe some of those little things that we did that bother us the rest of our lives might prevent us from doing worse things. I guarantee you, I've never called anybody that since that day so that's what that means so I pray pray today God deal with me God deal with me about my attitude God deal with me about how I treat people God deal with me about what I say to people what I don't say to people God if there's something in my character that's wrong I want, it, I want it changed. And if I could change it myself, I would. But normally I can't. So anyway, back to the leaven issue. Um, you think the devil knows how much it takes to affect a person the rest of their life? I'm sure he does. So think, think about, you know, that we've, we've talked about some of these snowflakes in our country. Some of these college people that whine and cry about every little thing because they've been pampered in America all their life and they don't really know what hardship and tyranny is about. Let them go to a third world country where they just shoot you because you belong to the wrong political party. Okay? Let them go someplace like that and live for a while. Where do you think people like that, how do you think those ideas get embedded into them? They do it, start out public school, you get some crazy liberal teacher who starts feeding them little bits of ideas into their young minds like guns are evil, all guns are evil. Do you think that everybody should have a gun? Well, it doesn't matter what the kids think. We have laws that tell us whether or not we can have a gun. Amen? Okay. We have a set of rules that we live by in this country, but they start dosing these little children with ideas like that then when they get into college now they're sitting under some professor who is a marxist leninist communist to the core who wants to basically overthrow the constitution of the united states and those young people get fed that stuff and that's what they're going to be probably the rest of their life this started years ago little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So think about what the devil did in, in Genesis. In fact, let's, let's turn there for a minute. Genesis 3, let's examine again how the devil got Eve to eat that fruit. And I want you to, I want you to look at this for a minute. 
Read over what the devil said to Eve and ask yourself, did he at any time say to Eve, why don't you take a bite out of that? Look at it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And that's it. That's all he said. Show me where the devil told her, eat that fruit he didn't he never said a word to her about why don't you eat that who decided to who heard it in their mind to eat it Eve that's how subtle he was he didn't, I, and I've made a point many times, he didn't force her to do it. And now that I think about it, he didn't even suggest it to her that she should take a bite out of it. Never said anything about it. He just drew her attention to it and told her some screwball thing that God never said, but he made it up and he made her to believe it. She and she alone bore the responsibility for taking a bite out of that fruit because he never said do it. If there was a trial and we put Satan up on charges of forcing Eve to eat that fruit, he would get off scot-free because he said, he would say, I, well, I have a record here. I never told her to eat that. Never even said eat it. Never said, why don't you eat it? Never said a word about it. That's leaven. That's leaven. And did it leaven the whole lump? It did very quickly too, didn't it? Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Be careful. Be careful what you're reading on the internet. Be careful what you're reading in books and magazines. Be careful. When you're watching the news, the news is very subtle, but they are definitely slanted, aren't they? Extremely sl and they and if you actually examine what they say, there's a method to what they do. They may sound like at first that they're saying this, but they always say, however, then they give some other person's point of view. And then quickly people make the decision to side with what the news person said. I mentioned to you the other day, I've seen a, a, a St. Louis Post-Dispatch story, um, headline story about in jails for very violent people who are acting up in jail they strap them down to a chair. And there's a reason why they do that. You can't have somebody in mixed population uh, stirring up other people, fighting other people. Some of these crazy heads that come in full of drugs, they think that they can bash through iron bars and they try it. And the only way to keep them from nearly killing themselves is to tie them down. But the way the Post-Dispatch put it, you know, Missouri still uses tie-down chairs. However, some states have banned them. Now, the article would probably never say we should ban tie-down chairs. Didn't have to. All they have to do is use the word ban. That's a bad word. And some states do. They must have a good reason. So now all of a sudden people are thinking we should ban tie-down chairs. Huh? Yeah. Just plant the idea. They'll run with it. Okay? And it works. It works well. So it wouldn't... 
How did we end up voting in marijuana in the state of Missouri? All you do is get people hooked on it, started on it. It'll pass. Right now, it's just medical. You think that's going to last? You think that, you think that we're going to stop there? Not on your life. Not on your life. Turn to Matthew 16. The devil knows how to do this. He's been doing this a long time, people. Long time. Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have bought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Remember that story? Where they had five loaves and two small fishes and they fed five thousand. Just the men were five thousand. Just the men. You have women, that's another five at least. And children, that's, you, that's another 10,000 right there. You probably got 20,000 people that got fed. And then they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that were left over. And he said, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many baskets you took up? And he, so he says, how is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Be careful of the Pharisees. And Jesus later on in, in Matthew 23, turn there very quickly, he told them, verse in verse 1, then spake Jesus the multitude unto the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. See, be careful, these Pharisees and these Sadducees. Yes, they are, the, they are of the 70 elders that Moses, instit, Moses instituted a rule of government over the people, put 70 elders in charge. They called it the Sanhedrin. And this is the ruling party of the Jews. Yes, they sit in Moses' seat, and yes, they judge the affairs of people. So in that sense, you follow the law. But don't do what they do. Because Jesus knew that they were following a whole different set of laws in their actions and in some of their religious practices. And Jesus said, be careful. Check all things with the word of God. Every thing with the word of God. Okay? There's a lot on the internet right now about Bill Gates, who I'm not a fan of, and his $1,000 vaccine, which I'm not a fan of. I don't trust the guy. But um, I corrected somebody this morning. They labeled a video saying it was Bill Gates. And I've seen the video years ago. And it wasn't Bill Gates then. It ain't Bill Gates now. But they're saying that they're going to force and kill everybody because there is a planned depopulation of the entire world. Have you all heard that? We're going to reduce the population from 7.5 billion down to 500 million people. Now, show me that in the Bible. Show me a verse. Show me two. I need two. But show me that plan in the scriptures. Revelation, Daniel, Hosea. Matthew 24, okay, I don't see it. I'm not saying that some people don't believe that, because I believe they do. I have a relative who refers to himself as a professional tree hugger. 
he works for a consortium, a, a charity group, lives in Colorado. This group gets large donations from big companies and they buy land in Colorado or wherever they need to buy it. They buy land and they run everybody out and say this is now a nature preserve. Okay, because the organization he belongs to is one of these tree-hugging organizations that believes there's too many people on the planet. We need to get everybody off. The humans are ruining the earth, but according to God, we're not. We have dominion over it. Do we not? Over the land, over the trees, over the fish, and over the moose and elk. We have dominion over them. So he belongs to a group that wants to depopulate. But I don't see, in fact, I said this, according to the book of Revelation, who is it that actually kills more humans off the world than anybody? God. When he starts pouring out vials of wrath, you're going to have millions of people die. And I mean large groups. At some point, uh, if you look in Revelation, start, when it starts unsealing, a fourth of the population gets killed by God opening the seals. So some things that are out on the internet, I don't believe them until I can see them here. Then I say, okay, I think maybe there's something to this. And the point is this, any of us can believe a lie. And you know what? More than likely, I do. If I knew it was a lie, I wouldn't believe it anymore. But I don't know sometimes whether what I think is true or not true. But one thing I know is true is this book. Without a doubt, this book is true 100% of the time. So when in doubt, trust scriptures. Trust them. Uh, because some lies that we believe are probably not going to hurt us in the long run. But some of them will. 1 Corinthians 5, turn there. First Corinthians 5, verse 6. Paul said this, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven. So what do you think that means? Purge out the old leaven. What do you think it means? In, the, in reference to doctrine. Um, let, me, let me just bring this up. Somebody who used to be in this church is now saying that you have to go to church on Saturday. That God demands worship on Saturday. Corporate church worship on Saturday. Can you with scriptures either support that idea or can you with scriptures refute that? I mean, obviously we don't believe that, right? Where are we? On Sunday. Church. But he says that that's a sin. So can you with scripture prove that he's wrong? I can. And I'm, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying when this was brought to me, I had to know from scripture what I was saying. So I had a lady call one time and she was of a seventh day group. And she said, boy, you know a lot about prophecy. How come you're not worshiping on the Sabbath? And I said, ma'am, I said, let me read to you the, the, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. But the seventh is the Sabbath day. You shall rest. You shall do no servile work on that day. And that's a, kind of a paraphrase. But if you go read it. I said, 
The commandment says nothing about having to worship God on that day in a building somewhere. I said it actually says that we're to rest. That's how we honor the Sabbath day and remember it and keep it holy. By resting, not going to church. And she went, I said, so if you can show me a scripture where it commands me to worship God in service only on one day and prohibits me from worshiping any other day. I'll gladly listen to it. And you know what? She changed her mind that day. She followed our ministry every day till the day she died. Others haven't been so... Yeah, gracious. But you see my point? We got a guy who used to be in this church saying that he's right and we're wrong. What is it that's keeping you from believing him and not this? Can you, can you find the scriptures where either he's wrong or he's right? Because that group says that actually Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. Can you prove this theory or this idea wrong with scripture? It's, and I'll tell you, in the day of social media, it's not just enough to say, well, that's what I believe. You have to have a reason. What did, the, what did Paul say? Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So either we're going to start worshiping on Saturday or we're going to reject it and say the Bible gives no such commandment. However, Christ rose on the first day of the week. We're here to commemorate. The first things belong to God anyway. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it also says in the scriptures upon the first day of the week. This is what they did. So this is why we do it. And my point is this. 30, 40 years ago, it was hard to recruit people with these doctrines. Today, I'll tell you, they got way more followers than I do. Because they were able to reach people. I, I worked for a lady uh, in a little t-shirt shop in the middle of a mall. It was one of these kiosks. I didn't work for very long because I was bad at it. She fired me. But... She was a Southern Baptist Sunday school for 20 years who got turned Jehovah's Witness. How in the world did that happen? Obviously, she didn't know her Bible. Obviously, she didn't. Starting will tell you. I've had the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness come to my door. He was there one time and I let them have it. I said, they won't be back by here anytime soon. Um, maybe, I, and I didn't treat them very nice. But anyway, I kept quoting scripture and quoting scripture and quoting scripture and quoting scripture. And that's what it takes. How did Jesus defend himself against Satan himself personally? Trying to tempt him. And, he, and Satan even used a portion of scripture to do it with. Did he not? He quoted Psalm 91, part of it. He shall give his angels charge of thee, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He used scripture to fight off the leaven and to purge it out. So I'm encouraging everybody. Do what I did. When God came to me in 1997 and said, we're going to study prophecy. And I started asking God questions about that. And I started reading. And at very early on, I said, God, I will purge out all the leaven of everything that I thought that I knew. And I'm going to start all over again. And I'm going to... I'm going to throw the rapture out. I'm going to throw everything out. And if it's true, I want to be able to say, this is thus saith the Lord. 
Here's what 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says. Here's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says. Here's what uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 says. Here's what Genesis chapter 5 says. And I want to be able to go from Scripture to Scripture to Scripture and give a reason why I believe what I believe. Else, if I can't find it in Scripture, I'm purging it. And that's what he's saying here. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed. So when they say we have to keep the Passover, why are we doing Easter? We must keep the Passover. Easter is a pagan festival. We keep the Passover. How come you're not keeping the Passover? You just simply answer them and say, Christ is our Passover. Now, they're not going to like that, but that's your answer. Christ is our Passover. Why are you not keeping the Sabbath? And I always say to them, how do you know what I do on Saturday? You standing around me watching me? How do you know what I do on Saturday? I rest. Now, I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. It's not possible for any one of us to know 100% everything that's true. Let God be true and every man a liar. It's not possible for any one of us to be right 100% of the time. You watch out for the person who says that they are. Stay away from them. Amen? Father, we ask your blessings. Lord, if you were to stand here in front of these people and tell them everything that I believe that is absolute nonsense and a lie, I would be very ashamed. Because I don't believe that I know it all. But some things I don't even question anymore. Because I know what your word says. I know what your word says. So, Father, teach us in each one of us. Number one, how to purge out our leaven first. And then, Father, teach me how to deal with people that I disagree with because I'm not good at it. And sometimes I feel ashamed. So, Father, would you help us, as you promised to do, help us to purge out any leaven, whether it's leaven of doctrine, leaven of politics, leaven of sin. Help us to purge it out and know what our Bible says and know the truth, because knowing the truth will make us free. Bless your word. Bless your people today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.